way of clarification, if you visit Moriel.org, you'll find out we don't just refute error. We plant churches, we have orphanages in Africa for AIDS babies and uh, feeding programs with Roger Oakland for hungry children living on rubbish tips in, in the Philippines, and we do a lot of other things other than what we're going to do tonight and what we do sometimes when we take a stand about certain doctrinal issues that we believe are seducing the church. But I do have to sometimes mention things that are wrong. This church is teaching prophecy much to its credit. Calvary Chapel movement was founded in part by an emphasis on end time prophecy. It came out of the Jesus movement of the late 1960s and early 70s, and end time prophecy was always cardinal, a cardinal feature of the ministry of Chuck Smith and of the founders of Calvary Chapel. That's one of the reasons it's grown. That's one of the reasons God has blessed it. Things have, however, changed in the last 40 years or so, and not always for the better. Remember, there was far less interest in the return of Jesus 40 years ago than there is now in most churches. In a Calvary chapel, you might not notice it, but if you're not in a Calvary chapel, you would have. 40 years ago, if you went to a Christian bookshop, you'd find books about the return of Christ. Some good, some not so good, but at least people were interested in the return of Jesus. Here we are now, 40 years later, and the books are not about that. The books are Seven Steps to Prosperity, Five Keys to Victory, and all kinds of things like this. Psychology masquerading as doctrine. Bad books, crazy books, New Age books, calling themselves Christian. Well, the fact that we're 40 years closer to his return and there's less interest now among most Christians than there was 40 years ago is a deception in itself. I only mention facts. We are being told by some people to avoid end-time prophecy. It's no secret. If you go to the Purpose Driven website, this is the teaching of Rick Warren. Keep away from end-time prophecy. He says it's a diversion. So he says. You can look for whatever, but what did Jesus say? When you see these things happening, be alert. I'm coming like a thief. That day should not overtake you like a thief. I'm not here to attack Rick Warren. I'm simply telling you what he teaches and what's on his website as compared to what Jesus taught us. Watch out for these things and be alert. There are other people who deny contemporary events in the Middle East have any prophetic significance, including Iran or Israel. Well, Jesus made it quite clear. Three times speaking in the first person, in Luke 21, 24, in Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39, and in Zechariah 12, verses 1 to 10, Jesus three times made it very clear the Jews must be back in Jerusalem for him to return. Again, I'm not attacking, but I firmly agree with Chuck Smith. These things fulfill prophecy. I firmly disagree with people like John Piper who say they don't. I think Chuck Smith is right. I, I'm positive he's right. The fact that the countries that are at the center of world events in biblical times are at the center of world events again is of prophetic significance. These things do point to the return of the Lord Jesus. With these things in view, let's understand Iran and prophecy. Let's begin by looking at when a friend becomes an enemy. Turn with me, please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, before we look to the book of Daniel. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Verse 22, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent the proclamation throughout his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Notice that God deals with other nations in terms of their relationship to Israel and the Jews and in terms of their relationship to the church. God deals with other nations prophetically <coughs> in terms of their relationship to Israel and the Jews and their relationship to the church. 
Abraham has two kinds of descendants through Isaac and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The anthropological and the theological. The anthropological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, of course, Israel and the Jews. The theological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are born-again believers. We have the descendants by birth. We have the descendants by second birth. God made it clear he would bless those who bless Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants and curse the ones who cursed them. Any nation or any empire that has ever cursed Israel and the Jews or any nation or any empire that has ever persecuted the true church have come under the judgment of God. One of my fears for the United States and the other Protestant democracies is that America is continually, continually evolving away from its biblical foundations as a nation and a society. <coughs> Already in California, I just read the decision by this judge revoking Proposition 8. It was openly hostile to Christians. It was openly hostile to people who have a biblical-based morality. It attacked faith-based morality. It attacked it and accused those having a faith-based morality of provoking violence against homosexuals simply because of their beliefs. Now, this is completely antithetical to the origins of American concepts of constitutional democracy, completely antithetical to what the Founding Fathers believed. Well, you're also seeing an increased pressure due to Arab oil money against Israel and the Jews. As we speak, the Saudi Arabians are funding the construction of mosques and Islamic institutions all over America. You cannot build one church in Saudi Arabia. President Bush, in order to honor Islam after September 11, put a copy of the Koran in the White House and began celebrating Ramadan. That was President Bush, who said he was a Christian. Of course, in Texas, they're all Christians at election time, but that's the way it is. The Koran is a book that says God has no son. God has no son. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget, according to the Surah and the Koran. He, he put a book saying God has no son to honor Islam after September 11th in, in the White House. Uh, you can't bring a copy of the Bible, of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, of the New Testament. You cannot bring a copy into Saudi Arabia. They have rights we don't, which is perfectly fine with our politicians in Washington who were owned and operated, obviously, by international oil and whoever else, but they don't care about us. They certainly don't care about Christians. They don't care about the word of God. It's all about money, power, greed. When nations have gone that way, God has dealt with them. Iran is a classic case of a nation that blessed Israel and turned against Israel. Let's look at the next page, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia, so that he sent the proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, Kurushan, Persian, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah." Whoever there is among you of his people, may his God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He's the God who is in Jerusalem. Notice you had a Gentile leader acknowledging the God of the Jews as the God. As the God. Well, my own family is a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Irish Catholic and Jewish. Why do my Irish Catholic relatives worship the God of my Jewish relatives? Gentiles will believe in the Jewish God. What happens when a nation begins to say, Allah is the same as the God of the Bible? What happens when we're beginning to have people tell us, like you have in the emergent church, it doesn't matter what name you call God by? What happens when you have an ecumenical movement or an interfaith movement? That looks for a rapprochement with other religions. When you have people saying there's salvation outside of the name of Jesus. You know, as we speak, and I'm only stating a fact, I'm only stating a fact. At this very moment in time, the most popular book in the world among Christians in the Western world being sold the most is a book entitled The Shack. Its author, William B. Young, openly states... Any God who requires his son to die as an atonement for sin does not exist. The man is not a Christian. He does not believe the gospel. He does not even believe in the God of Scripture. Well, what happens? 
yet they take the name of being Christian. This is very sad, and it's very dangerous. But it's not the first time it's happened. When you see nations who used to believe the truth, you'll see them going away from the teachings of Scripture. You'll see them going away from a monotheistic belief in the God of Israel, the one true God. Then you'll see them turning against his people, both the church and the Jews. That is a nation heading for God's judgment. I don't know if there's a reason, but right after, our present government condemned Israel for building apartments in Jerusalem <laughs> in order to please Muslim oil interests. Well, they had their own oil problem in the, in the Gulf. The biggest oil disaster. It, it, and it happened, it happened within 48 hours. As soon as our government forced Jews to leave Gaza without a treaty. Well, you want to please oil interests? <laughs> Hurricane Katrina came and lambasted the American oil industry in the Gulf. 40% of the refining capacity was temporarily curtailed. It cost billions and billions. These things wouldn't have happened at one time in history. Well, Persia is an example. Iran is an example of a nation who God blessed because they blessed his people. Now America is turning against both Israel and America is increasingly turning against the true church. What happened in California is an outrage. A judge issued a judicial ruling that is vehemently anti-Christian in terms of Christian morality. He says, having a faith-based basis of morality provokes hatred against homosexuals. He's blaming Christians and people who believe in God. And in his decision, he wrote, it is a fact that 84% of the people who voted for Proposition 8 go to church. <sighs> that was part of his decision. Because you go to church and you voted for Proposition 8, that proves that your religion, your faith, your beliefs are responsible for what he sees as behavior unjustly inimical against homosexuals, bearing in mind he's a homosexual himself. He's also a Republican nominated by Ronald Reagan and appointed to the Supreme Court by George Bush. Well, this is frightening. People in America begin to think, well, it's about po politics, Democrats, Republicans are more Christian. Well, let me tell you something. Look what happened to Iran. America's going the same way. It was a Republican Supreme Court in the days of President Eisenhower, Republican Supreme Court of Earl Warren, who ordered God out of the classroom. No more prayer in the schools. In the days of Nixon, it was a Republican Supreme Court of Warren Burger ordered God out of the maternity ward, Roe versus Wade. It was a Republican Supreme Court Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, appointed by Ronald Reagan, who wrote the decision ordering the Ten Commandments out of the judicial building. It was the Republicans Supreme Court who ordered God out of the courtroom, out of the maternity ward, and out of the classroom. Now they've ordered God, uh, ordered God out of social policy. Forget about the democratic will of the people of California, a homosexual Republican appointed by the... It's, it's, it's not about Democrat or Republican. Pray for whoever gets elected, but trust none of them. Nations get the leaders they deserve. Just as in the books of Kings and Chronicles, nations get the leaders they deserve. And so do churches. But in Iran, we have a classic situation of a nation and a government that blessed God's people, that God used to achieve his purposes, and then turned away. A friend became an enemy. A friend became an enemy. America was always a friend to the true church. America was always a friend to Israel and the Jews. But it's beginning to change. Let's look further. It was all prophesied. Let's begin by looking at Isaiah chapter 44. Liberal higher critics, liberal theologians don't like this because they say there's no God that we can be sure of, and even if there is a God, he doesn't know the future, and even if he did, he certainly wouldn't tell Isaiah. Therefore, they call this, quote-unquote, an ex China interpolation, or so they taught me in Cambridge. In other words, it was written after the fact and inserted to make it look like a prophetic prediction, but it wasn't because Isaiah could not have possibly known 200 years before King Cyrus was born, the name of Cyrus. But it says in chapter 44, verse 27, remembering there's no chapter divisions in the original Hebrew or Greek text, it says this in verse 27. It is I, 
who says to the depths of the sea, be dried up, and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. In Hebrew, definite possessive article. Ro'i, same as in Psalm 23. Yehovah ro'i, Adonai ro'i, the Lord is my shepherd. Cyrus is my shepherd. Same word as pastor in Hebrew, ro'e. He is my shepherd or the shepherd of Yahweh. The shepherd of Yahweh. Definite possessive article. Then it goes on to say, He will perform all my desires. He does the will of Yahweh. Then it goes on to predict, He declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of her temple your foundations will be laid. Predicts the restoration of Jerusalem, as did somebody else, as we'll see in a moment. Let's look. Chapter 45, verse 1. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the original text. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, definite possessive article. In Hebrew, Meshichi, my Messiah. In the Septuagint, in the Greek Old Testament, it says, Thus says the Lord, Kurios, to Cyrus, his Christ. He is called the, the Messiah. of Yahweh, the Messiah of Yahweh. Then it goes on, whom I've taken by the right hand. He rules by the right hand of Yahweh. What else does it say about King Cyrus? To subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. In the ancient Near East, he was given all power and dominion by Yahweh. Well, what else does it say about King Cyrus, king of Persia, king of Iran. To open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. He opens. No one closes. Let's see. He is the shepherd of Yahweh. He does the will of Yahweh. Not necessarily his own. He restores Jerusalem, or predicts the uh, restoration of Jerusalem. He's called the Messiah of Yahweh, in Greek, the Christ. He rules by the right hand of Yahweh. All power and dominion is given to him by Yahweh, and he opens and no one closes. Who else does this describe? Obviously, Jesus. Cyrus is one of the most important types of Christ in Scripture, which is remarkable considering the fact he's a Gentile. Now, there are a few, very few, other, gen- other non-Jews who typify the Messiah, but he's unique. In fact, there are very few Jews who would typify this Messiah in such detail in Scripture. But what does this mean? As Cyrus came and destroyed Babylon and restored Jerusalem. 
that happens again. Jesus Christ comes in the character of Cyrus, in the book of Revelation, destroys Babylon the Great and restores Jerusalem for the millennial reign. You understand? The way, according to the predictions of Daniel, that Cyrus, king of Persia, got rid of Babylon and established Jerusalem is a picture of what Jesus is going to do in the millennium. The future is always in the past. We must understand biblical history to understand future history. We're not just looking at what did happen, we're looking at what is going to happen. Well, let's go further with this. A friend becomes an enemy. Turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Daniel, chapter 2. We, of course, have the famous vision of the image. The head is gold and corresponds to the Babylonian Empire. Babylon is not just the Babylonian Empire, nor is it only Babylon the Great, although that's what it is ultimately. It's not the city of Rome alone, although Peter, writing metaphorically in his epistle from Rome, says she who was in Babylon greets you. He was almost certainly in Rome. The false religions, the mystery religions that began with Nimrod and Semiramis in Babylon made their way through Asia Minor, particularly the city of Pergamum, and from there into the Greco-Roman world. Hence, Peter identifies Rome with Babylon. It's sort of like, uh, I live in London, England, and we have Scotland Yard. Well, the original Scotland Yard in the days of Sherlock Holmes was a building near Parliament on the, on the Thames River. But the British police long ago outgrew that building. The new Scotland Yard is a half mile away on Victoria Street in a big building, but they still call it Scotland Yard. Or the original stock exchange in New York was on Wall Street, but the present stock exchange is on Broad Street, but they still call it Wall Street. Or most of the Broadway theaters in Manhattan, I speak about Manhattan, that's where I'm from, obviously. Well, the Broadway theaters were originally on Broadway. Now most of them are on the side streets off Broadway, but they still call it Broadway. In other words, the original location of an institution becomes its name, irrespective of where it's technically located. But then you have the beginning with the Tower of Babel, the head of gold. That is man's mentality. Man wants to make himself eternal. Gold is a non-corrosive metal. It doesn't oxidize. Man wants to deify himself. That was the idea of the Tower of Babel. In the Holy of Holies, things were not of silver or of bronze. Those precious metals were outside. In the Holy of Holies, it had to be gold because gold would not oxidize, would not rust. It speaks of that which is eternal. The mentality of the world, self-deification through wealth. Self-deification through wealth. That's the mentality of the fallen world, the head. That's how the world thinks. Then there was the silver chest, to torso with the two arms. Persia, Iran, and the Medes. Okay. The descendants of the Medes today are as close as any anthropologist can work out. The descendants of the Medes today are the Kurdish people, the Kurds. Okay. The Iranians are the descendants of the Persians. Now understand about the Iranians. Iran is simply the Persian word for Aryan. They are not Semitic people. They are not like Arabs and Jews. They are Aryans. They are the anthropological cousins of the Germans. And Iranian is, by genetic or origin, closer to an Austrian or a German than they are to an Arab or a Jew. Hitler thought he could get the Iranians on his side against the British and French because they were Aryans. That was his thinking. It didn't work, but that's what he wanted to do. 
In other words, they are an ethnic European people, an Indo-European people who live in the Middle East. But their culture is not the same as the Arabs. Their original religion was Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism, their prophet was Zarathustra. Now the Zoroastrian religion of ancient Persia has mutated and changed much the same as the Buddhism of today is not the Buddhism of Gautama. Gautama never claimed to be God. Or the Confucian religion of today is not the one of Confucius. Confucius was simply a social philosopher. He never claimed to be God. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, liberal Protestantism, they're not the Christianity of the New Testament. They mutated and changed. It's not what's found in the New Testament. Talmudic Judaism of the rabbis is not the Judaism of Moses and the prophets. It mutated and changed. Well, so too did Zoroastrianism. Zarathustra was very close to the Jews in many respects in the way he thought. The Jews had the truth because they had the Torah. They knew about the one true God. In the Western world, it was Socrates who was the closest to the Jews understanding monotheism. He had the most light, the most understanding in the Western world. In the Eastern light world, it was Zarathustra, Zoroaster, who had the most understanding. He said there was one God. Now today they've mutated, they've become fire venerators and all sorts of things, but originally they were quite close to the Jews in their thinking. They believed something very similar to what Jews and Christians believe about a war between the sons of darkness, the sons of light. Much of their literature looks like the Dead Sea Scrolls and its content. And they were amicable to the Jews because of Zoroastrianism. Today, even the public holidays in Iran remain Zoroastrian, not Muslim. Well, the Magi who came when Jesus was born, they came from the area that had been Media Persian. They had a tradition going back to the Babylonian captivity of the Jews and the Persian Empire, which they learned from the Jews that the Messiah was going to come. Hence, they responded to it. These were the first nation, the first Gentile nation to respond to Jesus were the Persians. They were the first ones. The Magi, well, they were Media Persians. They may have been Medes. These were the Magi. They came. People from Persia came first when Jesus was born. The Romans weren't. The Romans came much later. They didn't believe in him. They persecuted the early church. But the Persians, right at his birth, they were the first ones there. Going back to this prophecy in the book of Isaiah. They're the traditional enemies of the Arabs. Here lies something remarkable. Zoroastrianism became corrupt. There was a lot of social injustice. Its priests, its clergy were self-serving theocrats, and the poor people became alienated from their faith. A split happened after Muhammad died. Muhammad thought he could bring unity to the Arab nations by having one God like Christians and Jews had. Because Muhammad was ignorant of what it says in the book of Genesis. Ishmael's seed will always be divided. Esau's sword will be against his brother. Until the Arabs turn to Christ, they'll have no unity. They must make jihad against the Christian and against the Jew, because unless they have another enemy, they'll kill each other. That goes back to Genesis. Muhammad was dead. His theocrats wanted to follow his assistants, his deputies, like Abu Bakr, to have the leadership of Islam. His family wanted to make it a dynasty and follow his bloodline, Ali. Well, they had a battle at Kabbalah. Ali was killed. Today, to this day, they commemorate the battle of Kabbalah by auto-mutilation and by hacking children's heads open with hatchets. This is their religion. Of course, when the Crusades went on the spice trade to India during the Crusades, they saw this being observed with the flagellation rituals and the mutilation rituals, and it was imported into Europe, and it was practiced in convents and monasteries until the 20th century. That's where they got it. They copied it from this beating and all this stuff. Well, something happened. The Arabs hated the Persians. The Persians always hated the Arabs. But once the split came within Islam, the Shia Muslims went one way, the Sunni Muslims went the other way, the Iranians embraced Shia Islam because it was neither Sunni, not the religion of their enemies, the Arab, of their mainstream enemies, the Arabs, neither was it Zoroastrianism. They took on 
Islam as their religion. That was the beginning. Nonetheless, the peacock throne, that's what it was known as by Cyrus, still survived. And the peacock throne, although interrupted or punctuated at various times of history, basically, although it was not a pure dynasty, it was still a dynasty, it continued until 1979. From Cyrus to the Shah of Iran in 1979, Iran was friendly to Israel. One of the things that, well, the final thing that precipitated the Six-Day War in 1967 was the blockade of the Straits of, Ter- of, of, of Eilat. Because Israel got nearly 100% of its oil from Iran. The Shah would supply the Israelis with oil. Uh, once the Egyptians, backed by the Soviets, blockaded the port of Eilat, Israel was now out of oil. Lo and behold, the war had to happen. The Shah always remained friendly to the West, to the Christian nations, always remained friendly to Israel. He was a despot, but he was friendly to the West, and he was friendly to Israel. That ended in 1979, and something that Daniel predicted would happen in its place. Nonetheless, let's resume where we left off. You went from Babylon to Persia. The two arms, Media Persia. The pelvic region of the statue was the Greek world. The seminal influence of Western civilization and much of Eastern civilization comes from ancient Greece. That's where reproductive organs were located in that area of the statue that Daniel said Nebuchadnezzar saw the image of. The Western world, like America, we are a Hellenistic society. Beginning in the patristic age with the church fathers, Christianity became Hellenized. What had been Christianity became Hellenistic, became Christendom. The Western church is Hellenistic. Western democracies are Hellenistic. Even in countries like Japan, I was just in Japan and I was in Singapore, they mix Western values with Eastern culture. Even countries like Japan and Singapore, South Korea, are Hellenized. Europe, totally Hellenized. America, South America, Canada, we're Hellenistic. Our culture came from the Greeks. They had the seminal influence. Western civilization. From Greece would come the two legs, the Roman Empire, the East and the West. I'm sure Pastor Tom will be explaining these things and developing these things further. But the Persians followed the Babylonians just as was predicted by Daniel. Look with me, please, to Daniel chapter 5. Verse 24, the hand was sent from him, and on this inscription was written out, this is the inscription that was written, many, many tekel ufarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you've been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Pedes, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. The Arabs have hated the Persians ever since. Now the Babylonians then were not the same as Babylonians now. They were closer to, they were Chaldee people. Nonetheless, Saddam Hussein saw himself as not a reincarnation, but somebody who inherited the spirit, the mantle of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean in the 20th century, the 21st century. Because Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, as Jeremiah predicted, and, des- and, and destroyed Jerusalem, and subjected Jerusalem, and because Nebuchadnezzar invaded Persia, attacked Persia, he thought he was going to be the next Nebuchadnezzar. He actually tried to rebuild Babylon on its original location. In 1991, the American Air Force put an end to his plans, but that was his thinking. Saddam Hussein wanted to see himself and present himself as another Nebuchadnezzar. The things that happen now go back to what happened then. Well, let's look at this. The Persians take over as Daniel predicted. Daniel sees various other visions, but he sees an incredible war. In chapter 8, 
he sees a ram. Verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, which means the ruler of Baal, the god Baal, the demon god Baal, the king of the vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. And I looked to the vision, and it came about while I was looking that it was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was next to the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted my gaze and looked, and behold, a ram, which had two horns, was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, as in maids in Persia, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, towards Europe, northward, and southward. No other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue him from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. And he came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen, standing in front of the canal and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. And I saw him come next to the ram and he was enraged at him. He struck the ram and shattered his two horns. And the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him. There was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, a large horn was broken. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of the earth. The ram with the two horns is Persia. It's Iran. Their influence was prolific. Hinduism was begun by Persians, by Iranians, not by people in India. They had the same idea that God was an embodiment of a body. The top caste of India, its top social class, were the head, they were the Brahmins. White people, people whose descendants came from Persia into north uh, western India. The darker your skin, it's all based on racism, the lower your caste until you get down to the outcast, the Dalit. That's your karma. It's all, Hinduism is based on racism. Where did this idea come from? It came from Iranians, from Persians, from Europeans. That's where Hinduism evolved from. Well, that was to the east. But here, they tried to move west against Europe. Someone comes along, the father of Alexander the Great, his name is Philip of Macedonia. Philip of Macedonia was incredible. He was a military genius. He sort of was to the west what Genghis Khan was to the east. Nobody could stand against him. He organized armies of Europe into regiments. He regimented the armies. But he did something else. He was the father of Euro-federalism. At this time, Europe was Greece. There was no Roman Empire yet. The Germanic peoples, the Brits, the Celtic people, they were all pagan. It was Greece. Now Greece then was not just Greece, it was most of the Balkans, Macedonia and north into what is today Romania and places like that, Yugoslavia. It was Alexandria, part of northern Egypt. It extended down and encompassed at least 40% of modern Turkey. Down further, it encompassed western Syria, Lebanon, and eventually part of Israel. It went as far west as Sicily and part of Italy. This was the Greek world. It was much larger geographically than Greece is now. But there were polices, they were city-states, Athens and Corinth and Sparta. Philip of Macedonia realized for Europe to be a great power, all these little ones have to unite into one big one. Well, this happens again in the last days. All these has-been powers of Europe is part of what Daniel teaches. The British, the French, the, 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 the Italians, the Belgian empires are all gone. The only way they can still be a player on the global stage is to unite, they think. So they try to make the iron stick to the clay. Separate subject, I mentioned it in passing, but the father of this thinking was Philip of Macedonia. He began uniting Europe. His son was trained by Aristotle. 
in philosophy, literature, history. But his son was trained in military strategy by himself. His son, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was quite adventurous. He reached the desert of Belushistan and he conquered all the way down to Egypt. The Jews were aligned with the Persians, so they didn't want to back him against the Persians. But once he defeated the Persians, he came into Jerusalem. The Jews began bowing down to Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is a type of the Antichrist. He's one of the types of the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. They looked to him, to Europe, as making peace. Well, that will happen in the last days. You will have people coming from Europe to whom the Jews will look to make peace, but it will not be a lasting peace. At the age of 36, as Daniel predicts, that horn is broken. Alexander dies suddenly, and four of his generals divide his empire. The two that are the most important are the two that we find in Scripture. One is Ptolemy. Ptolemy. Uh, you have the city of Ptolemy, today called Akko in Israel, named after him. He gets part of Israel. He gets Egypt. Then you have Seleucus. Seleucus is the general who gets Lebanon, Syria, and the rest of Israel. And from Seleucus comes a dynasty of Antiochus. Antiochus the first, the second, the third, the fourth. Antiochus the fourth is Antiochus Epiphanes, another type of the Antichrist who sets up an image in the temple. Again, I'm sure Tom will explain these things. I simply mention them in passing because of their relevance to Iran. It comes. At the age of 36, Alexander snuffs it all of a sudden. He dies suddenly and his empire is divided. The Greek world refragments. Well, they tried to make a federal Europe and it didn't work. That happens in the last days. The iron does not adhere to the clay. They tried to make it. It works for a while, but only for a while. What happens? Europe fights Iran. The Western world fights Iran. In some way, there will again be a conflict between the Western world and Iran. It is not simply America who doesn't like Iran, who's afraid of Ahmadinejad. After September 11th, what's going to stop him from giving nuclear weapons to terrorists? Small ones. All you'd need is one in Washington, one in New York or Chicago, one in London, one in Paris, one in Tokyo. There goes the economy of the world. Then they have to say Islam was a religion of peace. We didn't approve of this. And they'll get politicians, you know, at the White House saying, yeah, we can't blame Islam for this. You know, same as what Bush did. We can't blame the people who did it for this. Let's put a car in the White House. It would be like that. Well, something bad's going to happen with Iran. Whatever Daniel saw, I don't know in its totality, but it was something terribly, terribly frightening. What happens next? What precipitates this war? Now understand, what happened in the book of Daniel, again, is recapitulated. It happens in the last days. A very rapid series of the rise and fall of world empires. Everybody's terrified of the Assyrians. They took the ten northern tribes into captivity. But out of nowhere, out of nowhere, they collapse. The Babylonians whack them and finish them off. Once the Assyrians were gone, everyone said, thank God. But as soon as they lifted up their head, they saw something worse. The last days is the same. Once the Iron Curtain collapsed, oh, thank God. Soviet Empire is gone. You lift up your head, there's something much more dangerous. When I was a little boy in New York, Nikita Khrushchev came to Manhattan. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, he took off his shoe and began pounding it on the podium in the UN saying, we will bury you, we will bury you. In a matter of months, he was gone. Sus Suslov and Brezhnev and Kasigan and those people said, we can't have a madman with his finger on the button. If you read the book, The Final Days, about Nixon trying to save his neck in the Watergate crisis when he called a nuclear alert against the Soviets during the Yom Kippur War, he was stoned on alcohol and tranquilizers 
and Kissinger and Haig were trying to keep him under control. In a matter of weeks, the Republican Party leadership in this country, Senator Goldwater and these people, got rid of him. We can't have a nut with his finger on the button. Soviet said, we can't have a nut with his finger on the button. The Americans said, we can't have a nut with his finger on the button. Islam does not think that way. Islam thinks, Allahu Akbar! <laughs> you understand, for us the assurance of salvation is the atonement of Jesus. In Islam, the assurance of salvation is shahadi, to die in a jihad. That's why they're willing to be suicide bombers. The only way to be sure you're going to have salvation in Islam is to die killing non-Muslims. They'll push the button. It's something very, very dangerous. It's the religion of peace. They always tell you it's a religion of peace. I ask the question. I've been in Morocco. I've been in Egypt. I've been in Brunei. I've been in Indonesia. I've been in Malaysia. I've been in Jordan. I've been... In to the, to the Gulf. I've been from one end of the Muslim world to the other. I defy, I challenge any politician to show me one country where Islam is either peaceful or tolerant. Find me one country in the Muslim world that will give Christians and Jews the rights they get here. Find me one country in the Muslim world that will give Christians and Jews the rights they have in Israel. They can't show you one. I'm involved with an organization in Britain called the Barnabas Fund which helps Christians in, in, in Muslim countries who are being persecuted. 98% of the evangelicals and pa evangelical pastors in Iran have been murdered, martyred by Islam. 98%! You've got 3.4 black African Christians murdered by Arab Muslim militias in Sudan and Darfur in the last 14 years. 3.4 million. You become a Christian even in a moderate Muslim country in the Middle East like Jordan or Egypt, you'll be arrested. They'll take your children, they'll take your property. Even in the moderate ones, you know, the tolerant ones. There's only one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights and religious freedom of Arab believers. That's Israel. That's the one everybody has to give. What are they going to do about this violation of Christian human rights in the Middle East? Oh, we'll find the one country in the Middle East that protects the rights of Arab Christians and we'll gang up on them, says C CNN. <laughs> says the BBC. That'll solve everything. We'll find the country in the Middle East that has the best record of human rights and women's rights. That's Israel. Look what happens to women in Islamic countries under Sharia. No, I don't agree with homosexuality, obviously, but look what happens to homosexuals and lesbians under Sharia, under Islamic law. What are we going to do to help these homosexuals who are being imprisoned and flogged in Muslim Oh, we'll find the one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights of homosexuals and lesbians. We'll get them. Let's boycott Israel. You understand the hypocrisy? It's unbelievable. <coughs> it is unbelievable. You know, there was a conference last April where Lynn Hybels, the wife of Bill Hybels from Chicago, I'm only telling you what happened. Bill Hybels, after September 11th, had a Muslim imam in his pulpit explaining Islam to Christians. Find me a mosque that will allow an evangelist to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was also attended by Tony Campola. <coughs> Tony Campola says, writes on his website, mysticism, mysticism, occult, is the common ground between Christianity and Islam. <coughs> Unbelievable. Well, Mr. Campola, and uh, Bill Heibel's wife, John Stott from England, they all joined the Kick Israel Club and began blaming Israel for what was happening in the Middle East. In Bethlehem at a Bible conference, they, at a Bible college, they had this conference last April. The very weekend of that conference, the Palestinian Authority, not Hamas, the Palestinian Authority, closed down the Christian TV station in Bethlehem, which the Israelis were happy to let broadcast the gospel and Christian music and things. 
What did they say? What did Kimpola say? What did Bill Heibel say? What did World Vision say? What did any of these people... Not, not a word. It's not just that they joined the Kick Israel Club, who protects Christians. They'll turn their backs on the persecuted church. I saw it. I watched it happen. My family are Israeli. My children are born in Israel. No, Israel's not perfect. But if I was an Arab Christian, I'd much rather live in Israel than live in Saudi Arabia or Iran or Darfur. But let's look. So what happens next? Turn with me, please. What is going to happen next? Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, now understand something, I'm only stating a fact. The Grand Mufti of Damascus attended, was invited to speak at the Crystal Cathedral by Robert Schuller. This is like a Muslim bishop. And he told people here in California, over in Orange Grove, Mr. Schuller stood up and said, I wouldn't mind if my grandchildren became Muslims. You understand what's happening? This is in America. This is in America. Let's just pray to God that when we don't have brothers like Dave Hunt and Chuck Smith around anymore, that movements like Calvary Chapel will still remain loyal to what the Word of God teaches about these issues. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar, and the message was true in one of the great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I didn't eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the three weeks were completed. And on the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl, his face had the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor and I retain no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees and said to me, O oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, the prince of Iran, was withstanding me for 21 days. Remember, he's fasting and praying 21 days. But there's a battle in the heavenlies going on for 21 days. We see this in Zechariah, we see it in Revelation. The conflicts on earth, especially the conflicts in the Middle East, are simply an extension of conflicts in the heavenlies. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I've come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to days yet future. And when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And behold, one who resembles a human being was touching my lips. I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O oh Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me. I have retained no strength. Whatever he saw scared him almost to the point of death. Isaiah said, it will be sheer terror to understand what it means. Whatever Habakkuk saw, 
scared Habakkuk so much that Habakkuk asked God to change the future. God told him no. But then it continues. Verse 17, For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. <coughs> then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me and said, O oh man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Notice it was so terrible he had to be supernaturally strengthened to face the reality of the vision. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. Notice he was fasting and praying for three weeks before this angel could come and explain to him what the vision meant. We are participants in a war. Our weapons, according to Ephesians 6, are the gospel, and the weapons are our prayers. It took three weeks. Not until the archangel Michael entered the fray did this angel even get through to Daniel. Jesus made it clear concerning demons, this kind only goes out by prayer and fasting. There are some very, very powerful demonic forces over nations. Some of my charismatic friends make the mistake of calling these things territorial spirits. That is a description. It is not the term. The term in Greek is arche. The term in Greek, uh, Hebrew, is rashiot. A much better translation is principalities, as in Ephesians chapter 6. We struggle not against flesh and blood. The enemy are not the Iranians or the Arabs. The enemy is the principalities, the demonic powers controlling these things. These nations are under the control of demonic powers. There are certain things that restrain demonic powers. One is human government. Do I like Mr. Obama? No. Do I like George Bush? No. Do I pray for those men? Yes. As reprehensible as I find our politicians, I realize if they're not being influenced by our prayers, they are going to be influenced by something worse. Pray for those in authority. Second thing is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But a time is going to come when the Holy Spirit is no longer going to restrain. That is part of the way the Antichrist will assume power. A third thing that restrains is a gospel-preaching church. But the true gospel is being preached less and less. Look what happened in Germany in the 1930s. Liberal Protestantism, higher criticism, came out of Germany's universities like Tübingen. 19th century German rationalist philosophy got into the church. Higher criticism, people like Boltzmann and these people. Conservative biblical Protestantism, the, the, the pietists and the German believers, they went down, down, down. What happened once the gospel went down in Germany? The ancient Teutonic demonic powers took it over. Churchill understood this. Churchill knew what had happened in Germany. He was not even a believer as far as I know, but he had a, a, a kind of a belief in God, based a Judeo-Christian belief in God. He knew that they went back to their Teutonic ways, to the, to the German war gods. These powers will always come back. I speak often in Belfast, Northern Ireland, the worst neighborhoods with the worst killings you can imagine. Where does the IRA and the Protestant UVF recruit people? in these working-class neighborhoods, but you see the murals on the wall. And they have Cahullin, you know, the, the mythical Celtic war god, and Irene, the war goddess, and demanding the blood of the youth. These same kinds of conflicts happened in pre-Christian Ireland, venerating these same demonic idols. But there is no place that has more principalities than the Middle East. 
It's growing in Africa with the resurgence of witch doctors in post-colonial Africa. They call it African nationalism, rediscovering African culture. In South Africa, you have to let witch doctors into hospital wards in the name of rediscovery of culture. You see this in Australia with the Aboriginal people. They talk about it as, in terms of culture. I was just in New Zealand last week. It was the Maoris, Maori culture. These are demonic religions. There's only one true God. Well, what happens? They come back, but especially in the Middle East. There is a principality over Iran that is terrible. In 1979, the Shah fell. The principality got power. What you see in this Shia Islamic fanaticism, this hatred of America, hatred of Christians, hatred of Jews, hatred of Arabs in Iran is the principality that Daniel saw. Make no mistake about it. There was a demonic power in control of Ahmadinejad. That's what Daniel saw. And it terrified Daniel. It forced Europe to act militarily. The Western world, in some way, will be forced to act again. Now remember, Babylon went. Assyria went. Then Babylon. Then Persia went. Then after Persia, Greece. Ultimately, Rome came out of the chaos. And in the middle of all this, the Jews were returning to the land. The same thing happens in the last days. If you told somebody of my generation who remembers the Cuban Missile Crisis in Vietnam that the Soviet Empire would self-destruct overnight, it would seem crazy. But they went. When my grandparents came to America from Britain, the sun never set on the British Empire. Now it sets every 24 hours. The British Empire, the French Empire went. Not many years ago, Japan was the economic dynamo of Asia. I was just in Japan about a month ago. They have public debt that's 200% of GDP. They've had five recessions in 12 years. Now America is teetering on the brink. Greece, Portugal, Spain, the European Union is teetering on the brink. These world, em world empires collapse one after another. And in the middle of all of it, the Jews go back to their land. And again, Persia arises. What's going to happen? The same thing that happened the last time. If you want to understand the future, understand the past. Whatever he saw scared him. Now we have people saying, well, we can bind these things in the name of Jesus. Daniel was fasting and praying three weeks. I lived in Haifa, Israel, where was the tomb of the Bab, the founder of the Baha'i cult. And every time a bus of Christian pilgrims from California or Ohio or Cornwall, England, gets off the tour bus, they stand around and they say, we bind this spirit of Baha'i in the name of Jesus. We command this abomination be cast into the sea. Well, it's still there. <laughs> These things have been there for centuries. They're not going anywhere that easily. Powerful angels couldn't overthrow them. It's frightening. Binding and loosing? Luo and Deo in Greek, that's not even what binding and loosing means. Before we conclude, and we'll conclude in a few minutes, look at Daniel chapter 17, please. I'm sorry, Acts 17. <coughs> Verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city filled with idols. So he was reasoning in a synagogue with Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the market every day with those who happen to be present. Paul makes it clear that other gods are demons, idols are demons. He uses the Greek word demonoi. Moses makes it clear that other gods are demons. He uses the Hebrew word shadim. Are Krishna is a demon. Allah is a demon. These are demons. Our Lady of Fatima, that's not Mary, that's a demon. These are demons. Well, how did Paul take on the demons? I bide the spirit of Athena worship in the name of Jesus. He was standing on Mars Hill on the Areopagus, looking up at the, at the Acropolis, which is still there, the, the Parthenon. What did he, I bind the spirit of Athena worship in the name of, no. He preached the gospel. Pick up the gospel. No interfaith dialogue, no ecumenical communion. 
No partnering for peace. You preach the gospel to these people. You see Muslims saved. You see Catholics saved. You see Jews saved. Binding and loosing, that's not even what it means in the Greek language. It's not this, we take it down. These things are too powerful. But notice, the conflict is there. Here it is, the prince of Iran, and the prince of Greece is coming. It may be possible that what he saw, it may be possible. I'm only telling you what it says. Look with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 9, the Lord's not slow about his promise, etc. But in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. The word there, elements in Greek, is stoichiae, where we get stoichiometry, elemental chemistry. You know, like the periodic chart, gram atomic weight, atomic numbers, stuff like that. The Greeks knew about elements, but they did not know about subatomic particles. They didn't know about neutrinos or positrons. They didn't know about quarks. They didn't know about neutrons, electrons, protons, none of that stuff. They certainly didn't know you could split an atom. In fact, the Greek word atmos means that which is indivisible. Yet a fisherman from Galilee 2,000 years ago says, not only can you dissolve an element, split an atom, you can do it in significant enough qu quantities to destroy the biosphere. It actually says that in Greek. That's exactly what it says. Nobody knew that was possible before Einstein and Oppenheimer. Nobody knew that was possible to the 20th century. But Peter, that's, that's exactly what it says in the Greek language. And you, Ask any Greek professor. That's exactly what it says. Maybe that's what Daniel saw. A nuclear holocaust. What are the nations afraid of Iran? Them getting a nuclear weapon. You understand? These people will use it. They believe Allah gave it to them. It'll bring about the Mahdi. It'll bring their savior, their messiah. You have a weak government in Washington run by people with no experience. <laughs> Who's going to stop it? Will Israel have to strike? Something's got to happen. One thing is for sure. The prince of Persia that Daniel saw is in the saddle. The prince of Palati that Daniel saw is driving Iran. And the Western world is coming. And Israel's caught in the middle. These things scared him to death. If you have any sense, they will scare you to death also. Unless you are like Daniel, a favored one. Even though this scenario was going to be impending and Daniel was terrified of it, Peace be to you, Daniel. Man of high esteem, don't be afraid. It actually tells him, don't be afraid. You see, before Jesus comes, there will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. But for those who know Jesus, there is a way out. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, tells us there will be a rescue. Rick Joyner says there is no rescue. Daniel said there is. Paul said there is. There is a way out. For those whose faith is truly in Jesus, who have repented of their sins, when you see these things happening, the same God who told Daniel, don't be afraid, tells us, don't be afraid. I understand my sister's husband was killed in the World Trade Center September 11th. My son got out of the Israeli army six months ago. I've had a son who was in Israel for two wars, fighting in tanks. People I know, my family under threat, the terrible things. I've lived in Israel for years. Uh, I've lost family. It's affected me personally. Our congregation, uh, we, we, our ministry is involved in supporting congregations of Jews and Arabs in Israel. People I know, believers, Jew and Arab, 
These things affect me personally and directly. They affect our ministry personally. It's not something remote. It's something I deal with. But I still know, because of where my faith is, I don't have to be afraid. Amen. Ultimately, my God is in control. But you know what? If you're not in a right relationship with God through faith in his son, the Messiah, you have plenty to be afraid of. Not just what's happening this side of kingdom come, but worse, what happens on the other. I'll leave you with one more prophecy from Daniel chapter 9. Verse 24, HaMashiach Hitzterek Ravo Velamut Lifnei HaHorban Shelebete Migdash HaShenit. The Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Well, the Messiah did come and die, and he died in my place. He died in your place. If you ask him to forgive your sin, he too will tell you, don't be afraid. He'll also show you what these things mean. People are going to the occult, they're going to astrologers, they're going to fortune tellers like Nancy Reagan trying to find out the future. We know the future. Jesus told us the future. The Hebrew prophets told us the future. The apostles told us the future. I don't need a horoscope. Those things are never accurate. They're matters of interpretation. I know the future. Not because I'm so clever but because my God is the true one. If you don't know him, if you are separated from the God of Israel by your sin and you repent and accept him tonight, the pastor and myself will be happy to talk to anyone who doesn't know Jesus. Things in the Middle East may seem to improve short term, but in the long term it is going to get worse. Iran will have a lot to do with it. Sooner or later, what Daniel saw is going to happen, and much of what Daniel saw is happening already, as we speak this moment. I watched the news report last night. Secret airplane flights coming from Iran, flying via Damascus to refuel, landing in Venezuela. People getting off the plane at a military airport, not knowing where they're going. There are terrorists being infiltrated right now to attack America up through Central America, right? Son of We've got what to be afraid of. You can't rely on your government to protect you. Our government is godless. Our government are godless men. Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. They're godless men. They're evil, evil, godless people. Pray for them, but don't trust them. As far as the church, how many churches can you trust these days? How many are still holding on to the word of God? Fortunately, this one is, but a lot of them aren't. We have what to be afraid of. Unless, unless, God says to you what he says to Daniel. I'd been in Israel when it was being attacked. I'd had family killed, had my son in wars. I know what I'm talking about firsthand. Some of you may have sons in the American military in, in Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan. You know what it's like. If you know Jesus, don't be afraid. But understand what is happening, why it's happening, and what is going to happen. If you don't know Jesus, I wouldn't want to be in your place. You have more to be afraid of than you realize. But if you'll stay tonight and talk to us, the Lord will do for you what he did for us. No matter what happens, no matter what you see on the news, no matter how terrifying that vision Daniel saw, don't be afraid. God bless.